welcome everybody. This is the Conversations with the Voice Actor. I'm here with Mick Wingard. Hello. Uh, Mick Wingard. And uh, we're going to just go through what we'll do here is I'm going to do kind of a long form interview. We'll just chat, have prepared questions. And then towards the end, we'll open it up. If you guys have any questions, we'll kind of like go through that. Sound good? Okay. So we're going to talk to Mick about his life. Uh, first, just a quick little bio here. We won't read through this, but you can go on his website. You can follow him both on Twitter and Instagram under Mick Wingert. Uh, you may or may not know, but Mick has a huge IMDb. I mean, I was impressed. Uh, like, well, there's a thanks. lot. You have a lot. I was like, what? You mean serious? Mucho. I was really impressed. Just everything here. We'll talk about a lot of this stuff, but Mick is a voice actor. That's yes, why I am. Here. That's why we're here. Me, I'm just a guy. I'm a friend. Uh, I do make comic books. I've worked on a little a couple of short films. Working on something now. My big thing is I have a Patreon. I have a YouTube channel called The Art of Comics. This will be there. I like to do interviews. I've been doing a lot of these long-form interviews with creators, mostly comic book creators and musicians. But I wanted to do one with my, my good buddy Mick here that I've known for many years. So I thought this would be a good opportunity. And here we are. So that's me. That's him. Let's get going. So let's start oh, off with geez. this photo. Yeah, dude. Oh, my god. We're going there, dude. What is there. that? <laughs> so, uh, Kevin, uh, Mick, you... Grew up in Fresno. I can't believe you put these up there for yeah, public consumption. Yeah, dude. This is not okay, guys. This I've known this guy since he since I was 13. Yeah. And he says, "Will you come be interviewed by uh, by this, me at the Long Beach Comic Con?" This is a roast. Uh, and all of a sudden, here's this photo. Yeah, here are two photos of me. Yeah. Uh, that are not fit for public consumption. All oh, that's on. missing is the nudity. I mean, I come on. I love your hair, by the way, in the, the one there, the younger one. Yes. It, you had great hair. I had great hair, and now <laughs> it's good. And, and now it's gone. Know, dude. It's now good. it's gone. It's okay. It happens. Now, let's talk about Fresno, though. So, um, All right. just tell me about growing up. What did your parents do for a living? Start there. Okay, uh, my parents do for a living. Uh, well, my dad worked for the Veterans Administration uh, Hospitals mm -hmm. for a long time, and he's retired now. And my mom was a hairstylist uh, for a long time, and just middle class family in yeah. Fresno. Uh, growing up, I was always kind of the theater kid, as you can see from at least one of those photos, <laughs> is me being very dramatic. And uh, I, they did a great job in terms of putting me in like you know theater camps and that kind of thing during the summers mm -hmm. um it, it for those of you who are not local to the central san joaquin valley which is the center of california it is technically a desert it doesn't get much precipitation uh and it gets really hot there it gets like 112 mm -hmm. degrees in the yeah. summer it's probably hotter now than yeah. it was when we were growing up but oh, really? but yeah with the way that Global temperatures warming. have have spiked but yeah, it gets really hot there and really dry. So, you know, even when you're doing theater, like <laughs> theater camps in the summer as a kid, you're like, oh my gosh, I can't put the makeup on my face. Do so. you remember like early, in the, going back to the early childhood, do you remember something that like really captured your imagination? That, like, oh, I want to do this. Or I really like this. Well, was there something? Uh, that's a good question. But do you mean like in terms of like what I'd like to do with my life? No, just like just that whole creative element. Oh my element. gosh, I loved, like, loved, loved animated cartoons. I think there were several shows that I ended up having this kind of love affair with uh, in terms of cartoons. Mm -hmm. But the first one had to be Battle of the Planets. Mm. Anybody here remember that? Battle of the Planets? It was Science Ninja Gacha Man, and it was brought in by a, uh, a media company, this is in the 70s, uh, called Sandy Frank. Okay. And it was, it's basically the, the trope of the Voltron team. Mm -hmm. yep. Teenagers in costumes who then pilot vehicles, and the vehicles kind of come together mm -hmm. to do a thing. Like in Battle of the Planets, they had a ship, and different parts of the ship would break off. But then the ship could go into like Fire Phoenix mode or whatever. Yeah. Anyway, I loved I loved that show, and uh, and that was kind of my my start. And then I loved cartoons and 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 usually when I was playing, 
as a kid, I was playing some form of make believe based mm -hmm. on the shows that I was watching, whether it was Thundar the Barbarian or yeah, Science Ninja Gacha Man or yeah. E Man or G.I. Joe or Transformers, that yeah. kind of thing. When did you connect, okay, I love this thing, to, hey, maybe I could do this thing? You know? Oh, gosh. Uh, probably not until after high school. Mm. Well, before that, though, your parents were taking, they were supporting you. Your yeah, creative, absolutely. They were taking yeah. you to acting stuff. So what got you into the acting part? What got you like, I want to go to acting camp, Mom? Like, what, what? You know what? I don't know. Um, I don't know. I just remember going to acting camp one, one summer and loving it. Mm-hmm. And I think it might have been that they had seen in me that I was like this performative performing arts kid and mm -hmm. stuck me in a theater camp. And I was like, yeah, sure. That's that's awesome. Let's 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 keep doing this. I like yeah. this. Yeah. Uh, and then I went to Roosevelt, which was a, a performing arts high school in our hometown. Yeah. And it was a magnet program uh, just for kids who wanted to do performing arts of all kinds, whether it was music or dance or art, visual arts, um, photography, even radio television at the time. Uh, and of course, stage, music, theater, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. So, um, so once I got in there and found this love of it, I just kept wanting to do more and more and more. Were you the type of kid, you know, you think of sometimes these comedians and they talk about as a, as when they do these family reunions, they get together and you're doing some kind of a skit or show. Were you kind of a, a showman performer in the, for the family? Oh yeah. Or, oh, you were. Oh, for sure. Like, uh, I have an uncle who would, uh. I think he, he missed his calling as a as a comedian, uh, and he he had like his his my uncle Greg had like six of his standard uh, impressions, and he would do them every year at Thanksgiving and at Christmas. And so we'd hear, okay, this is the early '80s, guys. Many of you will not get these references, but I'm looking at you, sir. You better get this. <laughs> he would do Reagan. He would do Rodney Dangerfield. He would do the little duck from the Tom and Jerry cartoons. The one that kind of sounded that? like Donald, but was much more clear. He was like, are you my mommy? That, that, that little like, that. I don't remember are you that my dude. mommy? Kind of oh, little oh, duckling, oh, really? the little yellow duckling. Hmm. He'd do that. Uh, who else would he do? Uh, Wolfman Jack. Oh, like he awesome. was doing all of these things. And I, of course, wanted to be the center of that attention and mm. wanted to get in on the act and i um and i absolutely like uh tried to match him mm. impression for impression like, okay. like i was like you know eight years old going well nancy and i decided we wanted to have jelly bellies for dinner you know <laughs> yeah. stuff like that and yeah. that's crazy mm -hmm. But it's what I did. So do you have do you have any like favorite impressions or accents? Like what are your even today then oh, and gosh. today? What's like one of your, your go to favorite the slays? Uh, the slays or, uh, or just that you like? Uh, Maybe it's not good, but <laughs> <laughs> what's good? So for the old timers in the room, I always loved impersonating the Marx Brothers, and okay. and my Chico was actually better than my Groucho. Although I did play Groucho you on did stage. Play Groucho, I uh, hey boss, so what do you do, huh? That's an old pie. What do you do, huh? So I, I like doing that. I like doing, uh, um, in terms of impressions, I love, do, I love doing Jack Nicholson, especially after the Batman film in 1989. Um, I love doing, uh, I'm glad you're who talk like this. Oh, God. I will choke you. Because, you know, when I was a kid, WrestleMania three happened, yeah. and that was a big deal. Yeah. Andre he tore the shirt off <laughs> Hogan's chest, and yeah. the cross came with it. Yeah. And you know, Ken Hogan slammed the giant. Uh, I love that. I would love to do a panel about wrestling. About wrestling? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So and cool. and and you know, oh yeah, the Macho oh, yeah. Man. I always oh. sleep with that one. Uh huh. Uh, you got to do Ric Flair. You got to do a little Ric Flair. No. You don't like Ric Flair? Oh, I, thought you oh, I love Ric Flair, but I don't, right. I don't you really... Don't do, you don't do Ric Flair? I thought you did. I mean, it's been a long time okay. since I've tried. Sting! Luger! It doesn't <laughs> matter when you're the... <laughs> Never mind. When you, to be the man, you gotta beat the man. Woo! Yeah. How's that? Was that That's all right? Good. Was okay. that all right? Anybody here, Ric Flair fans? Oh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. One. I got one. You got one. I got one. One out of ten. Thank, and I got a thumbs up. Thank there you. you. <laughs> I so, will always come to a panel for you. Thank you, dude. So about mentorship. 
So yes. did you have someone, you know, in those formative years before you were, you know, 18 that kind of like, okay, I see what you've got. I want to like guide you or do you, do, did you look to somebody to kind of like get some guidance on that? Yeah. Oh. Um, so my parents were supportive, but pretty uninterested. Like they yeah. weren't very invested in right. terms of like, yeah, the kid's doing a play. We should probably go see it. Yeah. But they weren't, they weren't you know, signing me up for classes and taking mm -hmm. me to various things. Right. They were fairly hands off, but I did, I did find some really good mentors um, pretty early on. The very first show I ever did, I did, and they did a thing that was called double casting. And double casting means that, you know, you have two, two different people playing the same part on any, uh, so that you can swap them out on mm -hmm. any given day. You have cast A and you have cast B. Mm -hmm. And, so not um, under studies. That's different. It's different. Okay. It's different. So, I actually the very first play I, I was in I was uh, it was a children's theater production and I my my co cast member playing the same part it was a, it was a version of Treasure Island it was a really crappy version of tre of Treasure Island uh, but the guy I was playing Captain Smollett and uh, and the guy who was cast opposite me was a was an adult actor in his like like late 20s at the time mm. and he really helped guide and direct me as to how to play things on stage and mm. how to how to handle myself in the world of acting mm. and it's interesting that you bring up mentors like I wouldn't be anywhere without the mentors mm. uh, in my life when I finally did move down to Los Angeles uh, in 2004 uh, I fell in with a guy named Pat Fraley, who yep. uh, did a bunch of cartoons in the in the '80s, and has gone on to become quite a prolific teacher and educator. And uh, I actually asked him to mentor me into the business, and he did. He like he not only what was amazing about Pat is that he's such a good teacher that he taught me also how to teach. Mm. So he taught me not only what's expected of a voice actor and how to navigate the career and expectations when you get in the, the voiceover booth and those kinds of things. But along the way, I watched how he teach, he taught people how to do this. Mm -hmm. And I learned like what I'm good at as an instructor and a coach. Mm -hmm. So my coaching business, I owe a hundred percent, 150% to Pat. To Pat. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Thank you. I like that. That's good. I think, um, it is hard to find mentors. Yes. It's very hard to find them and to keep that relationship and to build that relationship because it is, it does at least in the beginning feel like it's a one-sided thing. Like I need this from you, but. But what know, do I give you? Yeah what, yeah. what do you get out of this? So right. It's hard to find it. So when you do find it, when you find someone uh, in your circle of influence, keep on to them and send them Christmas cards and <laughs> what you have to do to keep that relationship. Let's talk about the decision to move to LA because so I want to hear about your you're starting on the business you're you're working in Fresno where you live after college tell me about what was it that made you say okay I got to be here I got to do this Um what was it that made me you know I had I, I went to Fresno State I was living a li a small life in my hometown and for those of you who aren't in media but want to get in media, and I know there's only a hand of you, a handful of you here at all, but if any of you are here because you want to know what it's like to get into the entertainment industry, uh, I, you know, I started where I was, and I, I had I had graduated from college, and I ended up working for a department store ch chain that has since gone under, but I was working for a department store chain in their advertising department. And I was sitting at a computer just writing copy. Now, it was the least creative job in a cube farm one could think of. Mm -hmm. It was very uh, Joe versus the volcano. It was very Stardew Valley. I worked for Joja uh, in Stardew Valley, for those of you who get that reference. Okay. And, uh, and, and I was like, there's got to be more than this. Mm -hmm. And I realized like at that point I was unencumbered I, uh, in terms of I didn't have any family obligations. Right. Yeah. Uh, I also was not in a relationship at the time. So I was like, you know, I this is the time. I am not getting any younger. Um, 
and I finally decided to, to move down here because I had realized that voice acting in and of itself was an actual career, that actors came here just to do that. Mm -hmm. But that actually was a change. That was, people didn't come to Los Angeles to be voice act. I'm pointing here like it's like we're in Los Angeles. We're not, we're in Long Beach. But people go to Los Angeles now and get into the industry to do what I do for a living. Whereas that wasn't a thing before the late 90s. Mm. People came to Los Angeles to be actors be and most of them screen. fell into like all the greats that you grew up watching fell into that as a career. Mm. They came and they had their headshots and they had their, they were going to on camera auditions. Mm. Just about everybody you can think of wow. we're was doing on trying. camera yeah. and then started booking in voiceover and decided that's where they were going to make, that's where they're going to plant their flag. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas my, our generation, the, the generation that like graduated high school in the late eighties, early nineties, when there was this big animation renaissance, you're talking about Batman the Animated Series and um, Animaniacs. Animaniacs and Looney, uh, Tiny Toon Adventures and, um, and on the Disney side, there was their one Saturday morning and the Gummy Bear Show and the Gargoyle Show and all of these things that were showcasing these talents who, who had fallen into this industry but was making a big deal mm. of it as an art form. And that, I think, sparked the imagination of guys like me who were like, I've always wanted to do what Mel Blanc does, mm -hmm. um, but didn't have a, whole de a, a huge desire to get on camera. I mean, you just flash up those old pics and you'll see yeah. why. Uh, but like, that's where I, that, that's, those were, the, those were the events, those were the shows that kind of opened up the imagination for folks like me. Yeah. And it was during that time that becoming a voice actor what became its own thing. Mm. That's around the time like when we went to our to our first Comic Con together mm -hmm. was in two thousand three, folks. This is two thousand three. Wow, you I remember do. there. Oh wow. And that was a couple of years after Mark Hamill had released his film, mm. Comic Book the Movie. Mm. And it was Mark <laughs> Hamill, who's again on camera actor, but at the time was arguably doing more voiceover than on camera in the early 2000s. And all of his voiceover buddies, people like Tom Kenny, who started on camera, Don Di John DiMaggio, who I don't know if he started on camera or not, but he does on camera. Like all of these actors who were famous voice actors doing incredible work mm. that were cap that again was capturing the imagination of, of audiences everywhere, did this movie called Comic Book the Movie and it was Mark Hamill's love letter to Comic-Con. Mm. And it was just before Comic-Con blew up yeah um but it was in that window that most of us realized oh my gosh i could actually do this for a living yeah and i didn't move down here until 2004 and i was 30 at that point i was long in the tooth to get for getting started so you get here i get here and then like what then how do, how does being here as a suddenly you know people are not going to come to you do you start going to mixers? Like, how do you yeah, network? Yeah, I do you started taking start classes. Like, okay. um, I started getting in front of people. I started working with Pat Fraley. I joined the union, and it happened to be at a time when they were having, they were, you know, actors like to be dramatic. I, I fully support the strike. I am on board. I think we absolutely should be striking right now, and I don't think it's a bad tactic, and I think it's uh, absolutely merited and warranted right now. And... I will tell you, actors can be dramatic. And so when you get them squabbling in a room about a contract, I mean, you may as well be lighting your hair on fire. Mm. Uh, just because that's how, that's how dramatic we can get. Now, <laughs> again, uh, we need to clean up on aisle six, please. Her, clean up on aisle six, her, thank you. Um, yeah, move that microphone, would you? Can you, can you put that somewhere? Anyway, um, so I, I joined the union, but I started making connections. And then I, I made connections uh, actually through a housemate. Uh, we, Steve-O. No, yes, oh. yes, but actually my, my roommate Dave, who lived with Steve-O and I. Oh, okay. And uh, uh, he introduced me to James Arnold Taylor. Oh. My friend James Arnold Taylor, who also served in a mentor capacity to mm. me. And is the guy that kicked me down my first major audition opportunity. Mm. He, he talked me up to a casting director and 
that's how I got Poe, and the rest is history. When did you make that transition? Because a lot of people struggle with this transition too of, I'm doing this part-time, to then, okay, I, I now the numbers are working, or the spreadsheet says, I now am going to stop the job at the blood bank or whatever, <laughs> and I'm gonna now full-time work as a, voyo, as a voice actor. When I booked the lead of a series. Which was a, which, which is at least a season, right? So mm -hmm. it's not just like a gig. It's like a full season. You right. knew that money is going to be coming in. Yep. And at that point, you're like, okay. I could cut the ties on that day job. Now, while I was cutting ties on that day job, I was, I was actually planning to keep my day job as long as I could. Mm. Right. Um, but, but it just so happened that they, they were downsizing and everything else anyway. So they got rid of me. And, uh, and while I was downsizing, I did start developing my teaching and coaching business mm. to keep, to help keep the lights on. And I also, and because I, I'm good at it um, and I enjoy it, but, but it was very practical for me. And I also started at the time working for a radio station. So I'd go and I'd, um, and doing just like commercial production. Mm. I worked at a, a station called Jack FM. Is Jack FM still around? Yeah. Jack FM still on the air? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, as any of you may know, Jack FM doesn't have DJs, so um, okay. any voices that get on the air are basically through their commercials mm -hmm. and, and or the one guy who is the voice of Jack FM right. who talks like this right. and whatever. Right, he tells a little so snarky jokes. He's yeah. very snarky. Yeah. Um, but I, but I, I got a job there mm -hmm. doing just running the board, and then they needed help in their commercial production, and that was my chance to do voice at work. I got, mm -hmm. I got to voice commercials. I got right. to produce you them. Did some engineering stuff. Got to do yeah. some engineering. Yeah. And that was – so I would go on a Friday and record all day – well, all morning for Kung Fu Panda. And then I'd do whatever I needed to do during the day. And then at night, I would be – I'd get up at like – I'd get up at like 10 p.m. to go do a midnight to six as the board operator, and part of that shift with was then going in when the next board op came in was going into the the other studio and mixing and recording commercials all night. Wow. Yeah. While you were working at, at while you were an actor at Propo. That well. yes. Wow. Yeah. You can't so, do you can't do that with a family. No. Well. <laughs> well, you could, but it'd be hard. <laughs> it'd be hard. <laughs> yes. Um, so let's talk a little bit about like. Making demos. Okay, making demos. And like, I remember you had like a commercial demo mm -hmm. and then you had like a, so tell us just like the process, a little bit of that and kind of the strategy behind those. Yeah, I, I highly, I mean, the way I did it, the first demo I ever made, uh, the first two demos I ever made were in the Fresno area. Mm -hmm. um, because between graduating college and moving down here, I had quite the odyssey of, uh, of, I toured with a theater company and then I came back to Fresno and I was a mobile DJ and the whole time I had made a friend who ran his own production studio. He had been in radio mm -hmm. and he helped me put together my very first cartoon voices demo. Mm -hmm. And it was chock full of the same mistakes I hear in everybody's demo, mm -hmm. but it was also useful for the time. So what do you want to know about making demos? Do you want to know about making demos today or about when I made my demo? Today. Today, okay. So today what's really important is that you keep it to about a minute if it's an animation wow. demo. Yeah, about 60 seconds. Back in my day, like back three. in my day, yeah, we had minutes, three or, minute yeah, demos and we liked it. We loved it. Uh, we have, it's a one minute demo. Um, what's really important these days that was not the case when I jumped into the business. When I jumped into the business, it was still transitioning uh, as us Gen Xers were getting older and our kids and, and showing various kinds of great animated TV shows to our kids, the, the, the tastes in animation have changed. Mm. Our parents, the boomers, like that Hanna-Barbera style yeah. and, and all the cartoons were made and all the performances were done for a Saturday morning kind mm, of sensibility, so. mm -hmm. meaning there needed to be enough acting that I, you know, that, that you didn't stink up the room, but I, I wasn't looking, you know, Saturday morning cartoons, you're not looking for in-depth character work right. in the performances. You're not looking for nuanced takes. Yeah. And so as I jumped in in 2004, it was still very much that way. What was really important about your character voice demo is you needed to show everything that you could do because at the time, everybody in town that was doing the work was doing all the work in town. Here's what I mean. So nowadays they send out auditions 
I would say even all over the world, if not all over the country, wow. depending on what they're trying to cast. And oftentimes they're going to on-camera actors because they're looking for a more nuanced style. Right. Back in my day, or back when I started, we were still kind of doing this Saturday morning thing where it was, there was only 50 people in town. All of these actors who had fallen into the business, as I talked about earlier, there was a 50 to 75 of them at any given time that were doing every Everything. show. Wow. So they'd go and do a session to maybe even two sessions in the morning, and they'd do a session and two sessions at night, and they were on 14 and 15. I remember when I first started really pursuing this, uh, I had found out at the time, I want to say it was the early, early 2000s, maybe 2001, 2002, and Tara Strong, who's still working today, she was on 14 yeah, I shows. I was just about to say her name. Yeah. yeah. She was on 14 shows all at the same time. Why? Because she could do 14 yeah. shows. I mean, she's a really talented actress with a very versatile instrument. And I'm sure she's not booking the way she used to. Because, not because she's gotten any worse. She's great at what she does. Yeah. She's booking less because the style has changed. So this brings me back to demos. Yeah. You want to have a demo that showcases your natural voice with your best acting first. Mm. Then you showcase a little bit of your utility. Then you showcase your natural voice maybe again. And then you pepper the rest of the clips at, with the other kinds of voices you can also do when you're not when, when you're changing your voice. Mm -hmm. And these clips should sound like they're pulled from real shows. I can't tell you, I've been in this business now since 2004, so 19 years, right? 19 years, almost 20 years. And I can't tell you the number of, of demos I have heard even this year that are made like they were, like the producer was making a demo for 1998, mm -hmm. where it is a, wacky voice with some really slick, well-produced sound effects underneath, but the sound effects are kind of generalized and non-specific and meaningless. They're just there to create a wacky ambiance or something that sort of supports, you know, the, the, the voice that's being done. And that just doesn't cut it anymore. Mm. That old school style of demo of here's all your voices. We're going to make up. We're going to pour rock and roll sauce all over them and make them sound all shiny. Just doesn't cut it. Yeah. The, the demos that cut through that get requested are the ones where the sound effects are specific and the sound effects and the music isn't overpowering. And the voice not only shines because of the vocal quality, but the voice shines because of the acting. Mm. It's a voice acting gig. Yeah. Every gig's an acting gig. Yep. So in terms of demos, that's what you want to be showcasing. Yeah. And, and so when I have people that approach me and say, hey, I want, I want a demo. And, and you know, I've been taking a couple classes. I always say, how's your acting? Are you a good actor? Have you studied acting? Because that's what you're demonstrating. That's what your demo should be. Yep. It's your, it's your real. Mm -hmm. uh, when you get to the enviable position that I'm in, when you get to be, uh, when you get to have a career with a pretty sizable IMDb base, like I don't have to go in and make a demo anymore. I can take clips from my work, your own work, yeah. and I can, I can string together a minute of just my best stuff, and um, and that's really cool. Yeah. But the reason I bring that up. It not only is it cool, but that that should be what your in-studio demo should be sounding like. Like somebody went and pulled clips of work that you're in. Even if you didn't do it on the air, we want those sound effects, we want that music, we want it all to sound like it's being produced for television, for film, not for demo. Yeah. Not just slick, Yeah. but for demo. I'll give you a great example So, of exactly what I'm talking about. I just made a demo. I have a producing partner who does the back end for me. Uh, I'm not taking any demo clients right now, um, but I do have I do have I, I have a few in the pipeline that I'm finishing up. We just finished one. The clip was this this robot saying, basically, everyone thinks that I'm a robot, and when everyone looks at me, they see a robot. But inside, this unit feels like a wizard. And my producing partner, who is great at his job. 
I think, got a little lazy on that one. <laughs> and so he put all these servo sounds underneath. <laughs> like, this, like this character is either moving all over the place, yeah. or we're just putting, we're just putting servo sounds under there to communicate he's a robot. Yeah. Well, he says that yeah. in his line, so we don't need it. Yeah. So I, I actually pushed back on him. I said, Brian, I love the production on all these other clips. This one, here's what I want. Get rid of all the servo sounds. Give yeah. me one for when he turns his head yeah. to say one part of the line and one to when he turns back to finish his original thought or to have an aside. Yeah. Give me two, two pinpoint Simplify. specific sounds because that's how it would go on the air. Yeah. You wouldn't hear all of his right. like that's not real. Yeah. That's not that's not how cartoons are made. Yeah. So, cool. There you awesome. Go. Let's talk projects. Projects. Let's talk projects. I'm gonna just we're just gonna bang through a couple of projects, tell me what you think of them, tell me what your all experience right. is, that kind of stuff, okay? All right. No wrong is this, is no wrong light, no wrong answers. Oh shoot. Is this the lightning round? Yes. Okay. Oh dear. I um, love Jonah Hex. Oh I'm a my huge gosh. fan of westerns. This is one of your first things. Now, what's a motion comic? Do they still make those? Tell me about uh, your experience with this. Sort of. My, my gut response to that is favorite villain. That's one of my favorite who villains. Were, who were you in this? I was uh, well, you Doc. Okay. That's okay. That's okay. So, the, the, jo the Jonah Hex motion comic was released around the time the feature film was made, mm. and they took the comics and used them as storyboards and just made, did a, a rough animation. So you're not talking about characters who move like this and have joints and articulation. Mm. We're talking like a freeze frame of Jonah Hex from the comic, like slides in, yeah. you know, over the top. I can't remember the name of my character's name. He was a traveling, he was this traveling snake, snake oil salesman. And the uh. comic that they picked um, for that story arc um, was was one of the modern run of Jonah Hex, and it was very horror. Okay. Kind. Yeah. Of, it was yeah. very horror <laughs> and very, yeah. uh, very dark and and very graphic. It was. A, the, they went for this dark graphic feel yeah. on on Jonah, um, and so, gosh, what was my character's name? Doc something or other. Anyway, uh, I, I played this guy like this. Mm. He was very like. Uh, he was like the the guy from um, from Poltergeist Two. If anybody saw Poltergeist 2, Man. he's like the old preacher. You're gonna die! That, that, You're that, 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 right? That kind of like, he's very high-pitched, very, like, slithery and slimy mm -hmm. and, and cruel. And um, that, doing that was great. I got to meet, I got to meet a guy named, uh, voice director who's still working today. I just saw him this week, Kelly Ward. He was one of the on-camera talents in the movie Grease. The oh, musical, wow. oh, wow. uh, and it's been a voice director for decades now, hmm. um, and he directed me on this. And cool. I remember in the death scene where Jonah Hex finally comes and takes out this bad nasty bad guy that I got to play, and he gets shot first, and he's not dead. He's like paralyzed, like shot in the gut, hmm. and and I he said, you know, and the line was something like, "Please don't kill me" or whatever. And I gave my performance and I put a little pathos on it. And he's like, don't make me, don't make me feel sorry for this guy. You're making me feel sorry for this guy. And he's of course that was, the, that was yeah. the take that he used. He really was just a great yeah. guy to work with and, and, That's awesome. and understood. That's awesome. Goosebumps 2. Goosebumps 2. That's where you sign up. The, Goosebumps 2 is where you sign up to do ADR <laughs> yeah. and end up the lead of the film. So tell me about that. How did that work? So they were looking for a Jack Black voice match. This was post uh, Kung Fu Panda. I had already been, I had already done three seasons of Kung Fu Panda. This might have even been while I was doing the second series, which which mm. aired on Amazon. And they just sent out auditions. We're looking for a Jack Black voice match. Uh, and I, my Your my agent was like, I have the Jack Black <laughs> voice match. Uh, Literally. And they, sent me, and they sent me in uh, to record it. And I got did to you, work. Did you audition? Or is it just like, hey, okay, we got him. Uh, okay. I, I believe me. I did audition. Okay, you audition. I did audition. Um, but it was requested. They said, okay. can we hear you yeah, on yeah, this? We want you. Yeah. And then they brought me in the room when they, yeah. they thought I was good enough. And then we, I worked for three or four days. I drove, to, d drove down to the Sony lot. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. you know, yeah. three weeks in a row, went in, laid down tracks. I actually got to work with the film's director, That's cool. uh, Ari, 
I want to, it's not Ari Aster, but he did win an Academy Award for a short that he did. Oh, what is his name? Anyway, I got to work with the director. At the same time, this movie came out at the same time as A House with a Clock in Its Walls, which also starred Jack Black. Anybody remember that movie? House with a Clock in Its Walls? So Jack couldn't, couldn't come in and cover his ADR for that movie. So at the same time, I came in, I was doing this movie, and then I got another call, I want to say from Paramount or whoever was doing House. It might have been Universal. Um, anyway, I got a call from them saying, go to this studio. They, they just need you to cover a couple of lines for Jack in this film. And it was the first time I had ever covered for Jack in a film. When I have covered for Jack, it's to be a char it's to be Poe, a character, yeah, to be the character he created, not to actually voice match him, as in him. as him. So, I came in and I actually some of my dialogue ended up in the film. Oh, so yeah? I yeah I'm, I'm credited as, as additional cool. voices on that. Oh, that's but, cool. That's um, cool. But I went in and I worked with Eli Roth. Oh yeah, of course. Eli Roth yeah. was like, and he's like. I have got to call Jack Black right now. I mean, I can't, dude. You're blowing me away. I can't. I can't that, believe that, what, I'm, really? what I'm what I'm hearing. Jack, I'm sitting here with a guy who sounds. It's amazing, dude. He sounds just like just bloop, like you. You know, no, <laughs> seriously. I mean, it's tripping me out. Yeah, we got to get lunch sometime. Okay, goodbye. Anyway, like <laughs> he had to call Jack yeah, and tell him that I was in studio, yeah. and. Yeah. Cool. I haven't heard from him since. Yeah. He never calls. He never writes. He used to send me flowers. How rude. Arcane. Favorite project. Okay, why? Um, because of the depth. Mm. Professor Heimerdinger is a character I booked out of the booth, meaning the auditions went around to everyone, and I just happened to be the okay. lucky one to get the callback, and at the callback, I booked it. So... Um, the drama, the writing, the character development of that whole, of that I'm whole not, ensemble. I've not seen it. I need, I know, <laughs> I know. Do I, I need to, is that like- Why am I here with you? <laughs> I don't know. I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen, I have to go. I have to go. We're out of time. And we're out of time. I, do I need, I won't go watch tomorrow. I hate you so much. Don't hate me. All right, so. I got a lot to watch. It's so in depth. <laughs> it's so beautifully done. Okay. All the characters have dimension. When we got into the audition process, I will never forget the callback because instead of it, get, instead of it being grindy, because sometimes when you get into the booth, the director and the writers, they are looking for a music of a line delivery and that they hear in their head. Mm -hmm. I said, we should go to the store. Then so the, until you say that, yeah. they, you just if you say, I said, we should go to the store. No, no, it, I said we should go to the store. And they're doing everything they can not to just do it for you and give you a line read. But that's what they really want to do. Yeah. But they've been told for years that actors hate that, so they try not to do that. And when I direct, I try not to do that. Right. And, like, just, just ask me for what you want and I'll yeah, give yeah. it to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, it could be really grindy. This was not. Mm -hmm. This was, they got in there and... I was Heimerdinger, and Heimerdinger, Heimerdinger has a very, like, character -y voice, you see. He's very, he's very almost like a Muppet, because he's a yordle. He's not a, he's not a human being. And as a yordle, he's, you know, very highfalutin and, and a bit uh, fantastic. He's a bit of a fantastic character. And what they were looking for was somebody who could bring the quality of Heimerdinger and his fantasticness and his his kind of exuberance from the League of Legends game, but put it in this very real world. Mm. I was told several times that Christian Link, the, uh, the writer of Arcane, was dead set on bringing in Heimerdinger, but, he, but nobody was sure we could do that and, and, or they could do that and, and have him feel real. So, um, so it was a toss up and they did these auditions. I know I was not the only candidate, but they were very surprised to find amongst uh, amongst my uh, my competitors some of us who could bring that mm. reality yeah. and that depth. Like this is a guy who's lived through the genocide of his village. He's seen an entire culture be decimated by the equivalent of a nuclear weapon mm. in in this world, mm -hmm. and so. The, the character had to live and breathe that way and feel like he fit in this world of this gritty reality where you have these other characters that are struggling with very real mental illness, uh, poverty, uh, social, um, <clears throat> social 
inequality, mm -hmm. injustice. Like it, it's a very mm -hmm. gritty drama, and it had and he had to fit. So, favorite in terms of my acting, yeah, <coughs> my favorite performance. Well, you sold me on it. I'm gonna watch it. I'll watch it tomorrow. I'll he's not gonna watch. It. I'll watch it tomorrow. He's, and I'll text you. He's not. I will text, text you. He's not gonna text me. I know how to text he's not gonna watch I know your it. Number. He doesn't. Eight oh five. Seven two seven. <laughs> okay, let's talk Tony Stark. We gotta my, mention. We gotta mention Tony Stark. My other favorite project. Okay. So, I got to be in the M MCU before it stopped being cool. <laughs> I love that I got the opportunity to take over for Robert Downey Jr. in What If. Um, it's a huge feather in my cap, but more than that, it's a huge privilege to carry on that character. How I got this is, um, this actually goes back to a direct-to-video that the old Marvel, I say old Marvel animation because Marvel Studios, the film, film department of Marvel, Marvel's very seg segmented, kind of like Disney is. And Studios, which did the feature films, decided that they, they hated how cheap animation looked because animation was under the umbrella of Marvel Entertainment. Mm. And the guy who ran Marvel Entertainment was notoriously cheap, trying to get as much for as little as possible. And Feige was like, I'm sick of our cartoon shows looking cheap. So I want animation under my department. Mm. And this was his flagship. And if you watch this series, you'll know it looks anything but cheap. Yeah. It is a gorgeous, yeah gorgeous animation style with lots of man hours put into it. Now, this though goes all the way back to the cheap days. Mm -hmm. So in the cheap days, uh, after, probably before, just before Infinity War, maybe, maybe even before that, uh, around Age of Ultron, I wanna say. So around the time Age of Ultron came out, what is that, 2018? No, earlier than that. I don't know, I don't know. whenever that was. I had actually auditioned for a straight to video that was going straight to Netflix done by Marvel Animation called Marvel Superheroes Frost Fight. And they were at the time Avengers Assemble was the show on the air, was the was the flagship Avengers show. They already had a cast. They already had an Iron Man. He was unavailable for this Frost Fight spin-off. It was scale meaning it was like minimum payment, like minimum union standard payment and the guy who was doing Iron Man at the time is Adrian Pazder, who is an on-camera talent of some notoriety. If you remember the series Heroes, he was uh, oh. one of the guys in Heroes. Oh, okay. Um, and, and he was like, not available. Yeah. So I, when I got the sides, I'm like, well, if I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do this the way Robert Downey Jr. did it. Mm. And, uh, and it was something about, it was some line about Santa Claus. And uh, I could see why, you know, something about like I can see why telling a kid that Santa Claus is real is better than you know ponying up for the I don't know I don't remember what it the exact the exact line I wish yeah. I did but there was something uh, there was something in the line where I said like uh, I just decided I would swing up on it the way Robert Downey Jr. does and I was like um, so I don't know why you would say that that's true but it seems to make sense to me and I just swung oh, up on, on, on it like that. Good. I love uh, that. <laughs> that was good. And when I did that, I was like, yeah, that's the vibe. That's yeah. what they're missing. It's the guy who thinks he's so funny. And he's, yeah. the, he's he not only thinks he's the smartest guy in the room, but he thinks Clever. he thinks he's above everyone else. Mm -hmm. So he's aloof. He's going to make fun yeah. of everything else. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I added that quality to my performance in the audition. I booked the job. All of a sudden... I'm in the session, I'm doing the thing, you know, you know, um, I, I, you know, we're, we're the, the frost fight's a very fun kind of uh, Thor adventure and they're using, they put Santa Claus basically is in, in Norse mythology. Anyway, long story endless. They loved it. They then put me in Lego. They had a Lego special. They put me in that. And then I, and then they invited me onto the cast of Avengers Assemble. So I got to do seasons four and five That's of awesome. Avengers Assemble. And then they were doing what if, and I had to audition yeah. and I had to go through callbacks and everything else, but I made the cut. They really liked my acting. That's awesome. So, That's so great. I got to be in the flagship and I got, you know, fellow cast members and, and the old exec producer from the animation days, even though their department was dissolved, they're like, yes, one of ours got in. They were patting me on the back. That's it was cool. really cool. That's cool. Cause I felt like I was carrying the banner for, yeah. 
for all of us who had done yep. those years of, of Marvel animation. That's cool. That's very neat. And brought it to life. We're out of time, but I want to do one last one. Uh, Ultraman, Attack on Titan, Bat Wheels. Let's do Bat Wheels. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Tell me about Bat Wheels. So, last, last Bat time. Wheels, I seem to have an affinity for... Um, or a, or a specialty in preschool animation. I don't know why, but I do. Uh, I think I think it's because I, I go for a uh, fairly theatrical kind of old school style. Even though I am capable of re you know really solid acting choices, uh, nuance is not my thing. Uh, you've known me since I was thirteen. I'm not necessarily the most nuanced guy I think that you've ever met. Um, so, <laughs> uh, so, you know. Preschool, it was a show coming out. I had done I had done a show and had kind of done a, a solid for the guy who was the EP of this. And he said, I'm doing this Batman thing. I want you to audition. And I auditioned. Um, and the first sides that I saw that came around were the Joker. Now, I mentioned earlier the 1989 Batman. I absolutely became obsessed with the character of the Joker. I had always liked the Joker. I, I kind of always like Penguin more, but that's me. Uh, I don't know. That, yeah, it's true. It's true. Um, but then when the '89 film came over, came around, I was all I was all about Joker. If I had the photo, I would share the photo. I know it's on photo. my Instagram. Oh, is it? Yeah. So, uh, so the photo is of me. It's the first cosplay I ever really did uh, back before cosplay was a thing. And so I, you know. I dressed up like the Joker for the for the movie. Oh no, I was Solomon Grundy for the movie, but Solomon I Grundy. I joked, but you, but I did the Joker Halloween, for Halloween. Cool. Yeah. Anyway, dream role is what all, all I'm trying to say in my long-winded <laughs> attempts here is that dream role since I was a kid, since I was like a sophomore in high school. So when those came around, I was like I know what they want for this. They want a Joker that feels like the Joker that Mark Hamill created. Mm -hmm for the animated series, but I know it's for preschool, so it can't be dark at all. So I gave him a couple of options, but one of them was like this, basically. And so I was basically doing my kind of lighthearted version. And it, it, at various times, it come, becomes a little Stewie Griffin, too. Mm. And, uh, yeah. you know. <laughs> Hello, Bat Bros. Look at my new caper. Like that kind of thing. Just yeah. made him goofy and silly and fun. I was thinking this is the clown prince of crime version mm -hmm. of the Joker, yeah. uh, and that was right in line with what they, what they cast. And I, I remember getting the call from the agent, and she was like, "You booked it!" Awesome. And then I, I heard from I got I got uh, a text message from my friend who's the EP, and he said, "I want you to know, you were you were up against all the top names in town. Everyone auditioned for this role, wow. and there were so many good ones." Wow. But you were the one that got it. That's awesome. So that's great. Know that you owned this role, that's and we're cool. absolutely excited to give it to you. Mick, I wish we had more time. We're out of time because I want to talk about directing. There's so many things to talk about, but we'll have to do a part.